It's longer time. Yay! Yay. Longer time. Poems, stories, and thoughts. By me, Paul Cree. Who else? Yes, greetings, bonjour, what's happening? Welcome to Lager Time, legions of lager lights, grab your tins, your bottles and your pints. My name is Paul Cree and this is my little podcast and blog where I share bits of my writing, stories, poems, thoughts, sometimes music. I don't get out much these days outside of my work. So this is my little outlet for the creative things I like to do. So welcome. As mentioned on the last episode, I didn't put one out last week as I've been a busy boy. Started teaching some sessions at a drama school up in North London twice a week, as well as all the extra rehearsals for this show called Love Scripted that I've been working on meant that I've barely been at home. But it's been worth it. Love Scripted is a devised piece of theatre and is the first part of a show we're developing with a group I co-lead alongside a director called Catherine Palmer for a Westminster-based charity called Dream Arts. Once the devising is done, I write the script and most of the music, so there's a lot of rapping in it, of course, with a bit of help from the group themselves. They're all young guys, mostly uh, of unaccompanied asylum seekers from various different places. Some have been with us for a couple of years. Some have not long arrived in the country. They're a great bunch of lads and a pleasure to work with. This is the third show we've made with this group and we stepped it up this year by expanding the project out of London, starting with last weekend, where we took them down to Paynton in Devon and performed alongside two other youth theatre companies at the Palace Theatre there. They did really, really well. A couple of the guys, this was their first ever performance on a stage. But give or take a few mistakes, which is expected, they banged it out and the piece was really well received. And they held their own amongst other established youth theatre companies. Not that it was a competition, but it was good because they got to see other young people doing a similar thing and have different people watch them. Usually our audiences are made up of social workers and key workers, etc. People that know them. Next stop for the project is Bristol in early June, Birmingham in July, then back to London for the grand finale in August. Next Monday, I step into rehearsals for Romeo and Juliet at the Polka Theatre in Wimbledon. It's a modern retelling of the story set in Merton, and there'll be lots of rapping and beats. Of course, as the show is uh, directed by my Beats and Elements spars, Comrade Murray and Lakeisha Lynch-Stevens. I'm the understudy for the role of Mercutio, so I'm very excited to get into a rehearsal room again. It's been a while. It's also nice to be back in the Merton Borough. I lived in Morden for a few years and was very fond of my time there. And funnily enough, it's where the name Lager Time came from, as it was something silly I used to say to my mate Dean just as I was getting ready to go to the pub. And so, on to this week's piece itself, continuing with the meditations theme. This week's piece is based on a quote from book four, where I talk about why I didn't like grime, as in the music. As ever, if you like this odd little niche thing that I'm doing over here, please recommend it to a mate. And if you fancy whipping the wallet out, you can make a donation on my Ko-Fi Buy Me A Lager account. There's a few copies left of my first book, The Suburban, which you can grab on my website, paulcree.co.uk, alongside a couple of other books, bits, then there's the music on Spotify, Apple and videos and YouTube and all that caper. That'll do for now. It will probably be another two weeks before I drop the next. Though I highly doubt anyone is that bothered. Keep it larger than life. Peas and taters. Paul.
Music enjoyment denial. Always have these two principles in readiness. First, to do only what the reason inherent in kingly and judicial power prescribes for the benefit of mankind. Second, to change your ground if in fact there is someone to correct and guide you away from some notion. But this transference must always spring from a conviction of justice or the common good, and your preferred course must be likewise, not simply for apparent pleasure or popularity. Book 4, 12 The more I work my way through these pieces, the more I think I'd like to revisit this as an exercise in the future. With each one I've put out so far, When I listen back to it, there's nearly always a thought arises that there was a more interesting and less self-absorbed direction I could have taken it or a big bit of information I missed out. But that's just it, isn't it? It's the game I'm playing. I could sit on this stuff forever and not put it out for fear that I'm always going to miss something or worse, get it wrong, whatever wrong is. Saying that though, I think and hope the more I do it, the better I'm going to get at it. Better, in this case, being more nuanced writing or something like that. What I can say is that I'm enjoying doing it. What else am I going to do? It all came out of a desire to get more out of the books I was reading, and that's certainly happening though I've been wondering if this process would work for all those football hooligan books I read when I was younger. As far as I'm concerned, there's little in the way of rules here. I read through the quotes I highlighted and typed up in each chapter, then see which one evokes anything. It's normally quite a few. I then pick one quote, read it again, and see what comes to mind. That's when I start banging out some words on the keyboard. Perhaps some would say this way of doing things is trite or just plain crap. Trap. Thoughts like that certainly pop up in my head quite a lot. As if what I'm doing is wrong or something, like it's school. As if anyone actually cares. Truth is, with any form of writing I've tried, from rapping to poetry to play scripts, I've never really known what I'm doing and just gone off a mixture of instinct and a faint sense of adventure. I don't know where any of this is going. And then picking up little skills on the like along the way, like some sort of satellite town Bilbo Baggins, but with none of those grandiose pre-plans for exploring mountains, dragons and that, and then writing a book about it, but definitely with a bag of that puff that Gandalf sorts him out with. Inevitably, the stuff that's going to come out first is the more anecdotal, autobiographical stuff. The self-absorbed stuff. Is it interesting? I don't know. Not for me to say. That's for you, I suppose. But like I say, I'm enjoying doing it. And perhaps the Marcus Aurelius quotes invoke something in some of you. I read bits from it almost every day now. It's a great resource and I'm really glad it's in my life now. So all of that is to say, it's going to be another trivial one. Sorry, not sorry. I'm going to talk about music, again, and the tribal aspect to it. For something so universal across the globe, so many of us still seem to dive into the safety of our tribes when it comes to choosing what music you listen to. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about scenes here, as I think that's something related but slightly different. As a side note, I think it's great when people get into scenes. 
as long as they don't entirely restrict themselves to it. I was once walking into some studios where different musicians, bands, DJs, etc. were, were rehearsing. Just as I was stepping in the main door, a couple of kids came out, who looked about 12, in what I would describe as heavy metal wear. They had long hair, denim with patches and metal bands on their t-shirts, knackered skateboard trainers, shortly followed by a few older metalers, maybe in their 50s, who came from a different room from a different group. A scene like that, which spans generations, but has a common uniform and a common cause, yeah, I like that, and I respect it. And why not? I think it's great. So anyway, as I've probably mentioned many times before, music was a big thing for me growing up. I've got five older siblings who were all into different music, as well as two parents, each into their own thing, and a younger sister. Most of my family played instruments, sung or made music to some degree as well. So luckily for me, I had all of that musical education almost by default, and I pretty much liked all of it, to varying degrees. From the blues my dad would play, to the indie, heavy metal, hip-hop and big beat my older brothers would play. Music speaks to me in a way that's very difficult to describe in words, perhaps because music and dance is probably a lot older than language itself, so maybe we lack the words to talk about it, only really the language of metaphors and similes. Even then, it's pretty hard to describe. When I was heavily into drum and bass back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I'd sometimes read the reviews of new releases in the various dance music magazines and often cringe when the journalist was trying to describe a bass line or drum pattern using grandiose science metaphors or something else equally ridiculous. I quite often had no idea what on earth they were talking about. Earth. Maybe they just get bored or have to reinvent the wheel every time they review a record. I don't care about your flowery words, mate. Just tell me if you think you're sick or not. So I stopped reading them. Like I say, music is hard to write about. But it matters. Marcus Aurelius talks a lot about the directing mind, taking control of all other aspects of being human. Trouble with that is, music is really something that you feel, first and foremost, and accepting that, and then thinking about it, is really how the order should be. But being human, we end up projecting other crap onto it, like identity and tribal association, often to the detriment of our own listening pleasure. I was once at a concert of some jazz musician playing very abstract and long pieces of music in some impossible to comprehend time signature and I was thinking, apart from the geezer jazzing out on the sax, who really is enjoying this? But in terms of that identity and projecting stuff, the case in point for me is grime music. I started MCing at the end of the 90s. My main thing was drum and bass with a little bit of hip hop as there was crossovers with the tempos of the different music, hip hop being roughly half the speed of drum and bass. But around that time, certainly in London and the surrounding counties, drum and bass's street popularity had been supplanted by a speed garage and then UK garage. Most of my mates who were DJs were playing garage and not drum and bass, so I wound up jumping on Garage and MCing over that, and it's a slightly different kettle of fish due to the difference in tempos and general vibe of the music. Drum and bass in that era tended to be a lot darker and techie. Techie? Shit, what does that even mean? I sound like one of those journalists. I resented Garage for taking drum and bass's crown as the king of the underground. However, I did like some of the tunes, like Roy Davis Jr.'s Gabriel, and when that darker garage sound started to emerge from the likes of LB, Ghost Recordings, Jameson, etc., I got really into it. That darker sound laid the blueprint for what went on to become dubstep and gram. All of that, along with the popularity of the crews, so Solid Crew, Pay As You Go and Heartless, 
gave rise to the popularity of MCs. UK hip-hop, minus a few exceptions like Roots Maneuver, was a footnote compared to these guys. And then Grime came along, in a big way. An MC rapper-led club sound, and there was nothing like it. But at first, I hated it. Despite coming round to the darker garage sound, I couldn't allow myself to like Grime. At first, I thought it was a mess. Badly produced shit rappers who were just shouting or repeating the same lines over and over. And of course, it was liked by rude boys. The type of which that would come to the events I was putting on by this point and cause trouble. Starting fights, robbing people, etc. Or at the very least, just standing on the side not taking their jackets off and not spending any money at the bar, thus pissing off the manager of this little club we were running gigs at and scaring the girls off. Not that drum and bass was much different, just that it had been around long enough for nerds to get into it and chin stroke over different drum edits, etc. So at least there was a bit of diversity in that sense amongst its fan base. Drum and bass was my thing. So therefore, I couldn't like Grime because Grime was their thing. There being a group of kids I didn't much like, and I probably thought I was better than, as if listening to drum and bass made me more intelligent or cultured or some other bollocks. At some point, one of my mates must have implored me to actually listen to it properly. So there I was one night, on the door of this pokey little club in Hawley where we were running gigs. I was taking the money and it was quiet. We had the garage and grime guys on earlier, of course, that was my preference, get it out of the way, drum and bass got the best sets. When one of the DJs dropped the instrumental to I Love You by Dizzy Rascal and at some point Pulse X and Save Soul. Now, if you know those tunes, you'll know they're not an easy listen, but legendary in grime circles. However, they moved me. I poked my head round the door to a largely empty club minus my mates and a few random rude boys leaning against the bar with their jackets still on, not buying any drinks. And that's when it hit me. This is sick. I was feeling it. I'd been in denial. I'd blocked myself from liking it. I'd heard all these tunes. But it's like I'd put a cork in my belly and blocked anything from escaping. And then again, I'm in a mate's car and he's playing all these DJ sets he's got off pirate radio, the various MC clashes like Wiley versus Dirty Dukes, now goods. And I don't know what it was, the energy of this whole thing, but I was going nuts. I realised I loved it. I was in, mate, fully in. I'd been lying to myself this whole time. All because I had some silly pretensions about who listened to it or whether the music was technically as good as drum and bass. Who even cares, mate? If he's sick, he's sick. I was just lucky that I had some mates who'd done the litmus test on me and brought up all my own bollocks to the surface. Around the same time, my mate Dean had got me a job working at HMV in Gatwick Airport. We'd get a lot of regular business flyers coming through who'd be in every month or so. There was this one guy who was probably in his 40s or 50s maybe. He was this podgy, hair-thinning, mild-mannered shy guy, always in a shirt, tie and trousers, who wouldn't look out of place in the games workshop or managing a branch of WH Smith's. However, he loved trance music and would buy every new compilation that came out. He seemed slightly embarrassed about it, but at the same time it's like he couldn't hold it in. He loved it. We had this little stereo in the corner where we'd let people listen to CDs if they were nice enough and he was a nice guy. So we'd load him up in the corner, he'd stick the headphones on and you could see his face light up if he was feeling it. He seemed very aware of who he was, his image, his station in life and how that was probably the total opposite of the type of person that would have been associated with trance music back then. He said once it was his dream to go to one of those big Ibiza phone parties. I don't know if he ever made it out there, but I remember thinking, fair play mate, and found him quite inspiring. 
I hope he did make it out there and it was everything he imagined it to be. I don't think I ever got into grime for popularity or even rapping for that matter. I like beats, rhythms and writing of course. All of that excites me. No, more than that, it moves me. And whilst my head is certainly prone to pretentious, wanky behaviour, I like to think I've gotten a bit better at being allowed to be proved wrong. I've been proven wrong many times. When I slag Garage off and then grime off to my mates, there was always that undeniable feeling that I probably just came across as a prick, but I stuffed it down. Like that time I was at this drum and bass night in Herbal, Shoreditch, and some nerd was in the toilet arguing about drum breaks that Fotec used in his early music and how he'd sold out or whatever. I remember thinking back then, despite sailing dangerously close to the gassy wind of a bell end myself, I don't ever want to be like this prick. It's longer time. Yay! Yay. Lager Time Poems, Stories and Thoughts By me, Paul Cree Who else?